Hey everyone, welcome to our first video about cellular respiration. In this video, we're going to talk about the equation for cellular respiration, the organelle where it happens, which is the mitochondria, and this idea called the endosymbiotic theory. In the next videos, we'll talk more in depth about the process. So the chemical equation for cellular respiration, you might notice, has some of the same parts as the chemical equation for photosynthesis, but they are considered complementary equations. The products of one are the reactants of another. So in this chemical equation, you have glucose, which is sugar that we would eat, and oxygen, which is the gas that we as humans and other animal species breathe in. And those are the things that are considered the reactants. Those are going into this chemical equation. And coming out is carbon dioxide, which is the gas we breathe out. Water, you lose water all sorts of ways. Um, sweat is one example. And ATP, which is energy. And honestly, ATP is the whole reason for doing this process. So we want to make a lot of ATP, which is just usable energy. It stands for adenosine triphosphate. So the overall chemical equation for cellular respiration is glucose plus oxygen yields or gives these products, carbon dioxide, water, and ATP energy. Where does it happen? Well, cellular respiration takes place in an organelle called the mitochondria. And you might have heard the mitochondria referred to as the powerhouse of the cell or the mighty mitochondria. And that's because it does produce that ATP energy. You can see this is a mitochondria. You can see how they are in comparison to the rest of the size of an animal cell. They are much smaller than an animal cell, but they are pretty complex. So I want you to know several different parts of this mitochondria. Let's start at the outside. There's an outer membrane. So just like the chloroplast, there's an outer membrane and there's an inner membrane. So two membranes outer membrane here, and it's kind of circular shape, kind of an oval. And then the inner membrane, and I want you to really look at this inner membrane. This inner membrane has all these kind of like projections in it. Um, it's kind of an unusual shape. And those areas where it curves inward are called cristae. And if you look at the surface of the inner membrane, you notice it actually has a really high surface area. So because of the way that it curves, ends up increasing the surface area of the inner membrane. I'm tracing it here. You can, you can follow along. And that's really good because when you have more surface area, more reactions can take place and more material can be exchanged. We'll talk about that a little more later. Now, the space between the outer membrane and the inner membrane is referred to as the intermembrane space. So basically just means the space between the membranes. So, so far we have the outer membrane, the inner membrane, the cristae, which is where the inner membrane folds inward, and then we have the inner membrane space. And inside of the inner membrane is a gel-like substance, this kind of red stuff in the picture. That's the matrix. It's a gel-like substance, kind of like cytoplasm, but when it's inside of a mitochondria, it's called the mitochondrial matrix. And you'll notice that floating in the matrix is circular DNA, and these dots are ribosomes. So they're DNA and ribosomes within the mitochondria. Um, that's kind of, again, like how the chloroplast had DNA and ribosomes in it. So um, that's, that's an interesting detail there. If it has its own DNA and its own ribosomes, then it can make its own proteins. Down here, you also see porins. Um, that's not super important for you for this class, but it just does allow material to pass into um, the mitochondria through the outer membrane. So again, looking at the surface area of the inner membrane is because it's folded in on these cristae, has a high surface area. And then looking at DNA and ribosomes, we can tell that it can have its own genetic information and make its own proteins.
All right, so the fact that it has its own genetic information and can make its own proteins leads us to this idea called the endosymbiotic theory. The endosymbiotic theory states that some of the organelles in eukaryotic cells were perhaps once prokaryotic, like bacteria, free living cells on their own for several reasons. First of all, the mitochondria and the chloroplast are the same size as prokaryotic or bacteria cells, and they divide in the same way. So if your body needs more mitochondria within its cells, those mitochondria divide even without the whole cells dividing, but the mitochondria themselves can divide in the same way that a bacteria cell would divide. Also, mitochondria and chloroplasts both have their own DNA and ribosomes, which are the little dots here. And so the fact that they have their own DNA and ribosomes, you can see it in the chloroplast too, DNA and ribosomes, tells us that they have their own genetic information and they can make their own proteins separately of the whole cell. So we think that maybe perhaps these mitochondria and chloroplasts existed as their own individual cells at some point in time and then eventually were taken in by um, different organisms. Like plants would have taken in both chloroplasts and mitochondria. Animals would have taken in mitochondria and that then they help our cells with processing energy. So, um, Thanks for listening. That's kind of an interesting idea. Um, next video, we'll talk more about this process of cellular respiration.